During this session, we're gonna talk about the actual nuts and the bolts of the single wing, the unbalanced single wing, and where we place our personnel and kind of go over those type things. And after that, we're gonna kind of get into uh, what it takes for each player to play a certain position, where you place those guys, and then how we call our plays, our numbering system, just so you can see down the road in further videos how it all kind of fits together. So on the screen right here, we have our base formation, okay? Uh, you can call that a color, you can call it right, whatever it is, but that's our basic formation set to the right. And so uh, we are unbalanced. We have a guard and two tackles on the same side. On the back side, we have a quick guard and a tight end. The X receiver is split basically three yards from the outside tackle, and I'll go over reasons why we put him there as we go on. The wing back is one by one outside the outside tackle. The blocking back is a yard behind the inside tackle. And then the tailback and the fullback are basically lining up on the two guards. Now we move them around for certain plays and basically if the snap is gonna be a certain way, we can move those two guys around, but that is our base formation, okay? Now, the two main formations we would run as change-up formations are these two. We have on and we have over. On just brings the tight end from the weak side to the strong side. He lines up in the wide receiver position, three yard split. That bumps the X receiver out anywhere from seven to 10 yards. The reason we use this formation is it gets a cornerback out of the box. It makes the defense spread up a little bit. We get an extra blocker on the perimeter. And also going back to the quick guard side of the defense over adjusts, we've got a, the ability to run back to that other side. The over formation, you can see the tight end has been covered up. That's kind of unusual, but a lot of time we'll shift to that formation and leave the tight end where he was pre-shift. You'll see that on videos that he gets covered up. That gives us a four blocker side with the guard, the tight end, and both tackles. That formation, again, if the people over shift, we can run back to the weak side, to the strong side. Sometimes people leave an extra gap uncovered inside. So the X receiver remains in the same place, blocking back still behind the inside tackle, and the tailback and the fullback are on the guard. So those are the basic two change-up formations that we run with our base offense. So those are the ones we have our base set. We can call it for use of this as right. We'd have then right on and right over. Now, personnel-wise, the first guy we're always trying to place and figure out who it is is going to be the tailback. Okay, he is the one guy in the program. If you want to get him the ball, okay, it's the tailback. We're going to snap it to him. He's going to run the power play to the strong side. He's going to run a sweep. It'd be great if he could throw some. But the tailback is the guy that's going to be, uh, you know, if you're going to have a 1,000-yard rusher, it's probably going to be the tailback in the single wing. He is the true, probably best athlete on the offense. The fullback is a crucial guy because, I say he's the quarterback of the offense as far as leader, calling the cadence, shifts, et cetera, but he's got to be a lead blocker. Not everyone asks their quarterback to be a lead blocker 20, 25 times a game, but we do. We don't call him a QB. We call him a fullback, and so that guy is a crucial guy. Um, his ability will show what you can do for a change-up series, whether it be the spin series, the buck lateral series, the T series, there's lots of different series within the single wing, and the fullback's ability really sets up your second series. The power series is the first series, which we'll talk about, but the fullback is a crucial guy because he doesn't have to be as good of a runner as he does a blocker. Now, the blocking back, that's the guy, it's the hardest guy to find because he's gotta to be tough, he's gotta to love contact, but he's also gotta be very, very smart. Our offensive line are going to make calls on the different plays. They have ownership of the plays. Each O-lineman will own a play. But all those calls go to the blocking back. So the blocking back's got to be a guy that's really smart. So to have a guy that's tough and smart and somewhat athletic, those guys are hard to find. And so a lot of times if they could play blocking back, they'd be playing another position, defensive tackle, linebacker, somewhere else. So what I used to do at Apopka was I'd go down and get like the seventh D lineman and say, hey, man, you're not going to play unless we're up by 30 on the D-line, but you come over here to blocking back, you'll play every dang down. And that's how we kind of got some blocking backs from, uh, from the other side of the ball. 
So, again, this is a guy that if you don't have a blocking bag, you really can't run the offense. He's the unsung hero to the whole thing. Hard guy to find, but absolutely crucial to your success. The wing back would be the second best runner. He doesn't have to be big. We've had some really small ones. He's got to be quick. He's got to be willing to block. Hopefully he can catch a pass. But, again, he's the home run hitter. We probably have more long runs by the wing back than any other position, including the tailback. But, again, he doesn't have to make a lot of physical blocks by himself. If he's blocking a defensive end, it's usually a double team with the tackle. Sometimes he'll block out on the force player. But a lot of times he's blocking the cornerback. And so the wingback can be a little bit smaller guy. His running ability is important, and he's got to have a willingness to block. The receiver is a guy that is definitely chosen for blocking more than anything else. We don't throw the ball a lot. You know, we have had seasons we've thrown for over 1,000 yards, but the receiver's got to be a guy that's willing to block. He's lined up three yards from the outside tackle. He's got to block linebackers. He's got to block strong safeties. He's got to block the free safety. He's got to be a guy that's willing to get after it. So, again, that guy is not your typical burner type uh, speed guy on the outside. If you have that guy, you can use him as long as he's willing to block. But his blocking is absolutely crucial. The tight end is usually a bigger receiver. I don't want to put an extra offensive lineman in there. If we had to just throw an offensive line in there, it would really hurt the passing game. The blocking schemes that we require him to do don't have him blocking a big old D lineman by himself. So the schemes can kind of help him. So if you have two similar type receiver types, maybe 180 pounds, 190 pounds, those guys are great to both put on the field at the same time because then you can shift and one can go from tight end to receiver and vice versa. But the tight end is really more of a receiver, a bigger receiver, than he would be an offensive lineman. He's always on the weak side of the, of the offense. Now, as far as the actual offensive linemen go, the outside tackle has got to be the dude. We are blessed at Apopkin that we had three Army All-Americans in a row play that position. So we really were thankful for those guys. But whether you've got Army All-Americans or guys that are just trying to scrap and get on the field, your best offensive lineman has got to play the outside tackle position. He's got to reach block, base block, pull, down block. He's got to do it all. So without a doubt, you put your best offensive lineman at the outside tackle position. He's got to block uh, defensive backs, so he's got to have enough ability to go hit in space. So he's probably the best runner of all the offensive linemen. The quick guard, again, a little different characteristics here. The strong guard, the quick guard aren't the same guy. The quick guard, most of his pulls are going to be inside the tackle box. He's going to block the front side linebacker, backer one, we say, on the power play. Okay, he's going to be blocking in space uh, just outside of the tight end edge. But all of his blocks are within the tackle box area. So, again, I think that he can be a guy that doesn't run quite as well as a strong guard. The center, okay, with him, the snap is everything. Okay, they've got to be able to snap the ball accurately. It's a shotgun snap, if you will, but it's got to be an accurate snap. It can't be all over the place. We got to have an accurate snap. So the guy doesn't have to be a great blocker. If he can block the A-gap defensive lineman on whichever side he's on, that's all we ask him to do. So again, I think that it's important to have a center that can accurately snap. We played there with one year that we had a center that was 170 pounds, and he was fine if he can just snap and block the A-gap. And then the last guy that we that we put out there is the inside tackle. He doesn't have to be very good. If he can run, it does help us a little bit, but he's got to be a little bit bigger guy because he's got to block D linemen. And again, if he can just block the nearest D lineman to him, usually that'll work. Okay, and so the inside tackle is really the last guy you're trying to place. So if there's an offensive lineman that you're trying to hide in an unbalanced line, we can do that with the inside tackle. Now, want to get into the terminology and the plays and and that and. This is how we call our plays. Okay, you'll see the plays are over here. So the even plays, 8, 6, 4, and 2, those are not to the right. Those are to the strong side. So if we're running a formation to the left and a sweep to the left, it'd still be 8. Okay, it just might be left 8 instead of right 8. 
But the plays don't go left and right. They go strong and weak. That's why we flip the alignment. Okay? So on our eight play, that's our strong sweep. The plays that we're going to go over in further videos are going to be blood block, lightning, and polo. Our sixth play is our number one play. That's our power play. We have three calls with that play. Those are loose, tight, and tunnel. Okay. Our four play is our strong side ISO. We're going to run it in the B gap or the C gap. The two play is one that we don't run every year. Some years it's been good. Some years we're going to run it. That's the strong side trap. We could gut block that or tug block that. The weak trap is play number three. So you can see we don't have a zero and we don't have a one. Sugar and salt are, are calls that would be on, the, on those plays. Our second play, as far as yardage, is probably the weak side counter. And you can see there's all kinds of calls and wrinkles to go with that. That'll be the longest session on the counter play. The counter sweep is the weak side play. Okay, that's a weak side sweep. And there's the different variations of it. We have two types of passes, sprint out passes or cats, panther and cheetah. And then our cities are our pocket passes, which are Vegas and Chicago. Now, one thing I want to mention is the ownership of the plays because we have someone that can make a call on each play and say who owns the play. On the eight play, the sweep, okay, the coach is going to call that. Okay? The wing back could make a call, a polo call, but for the most part, that's a coach-called play. Once the coach calls the sixth play, the outside tackle is then going to make the call Lose tighter tunnel. It's his play. He owns it. Okay. On the four play, the inside tackle. He owns that. He's going to make those calls. The guard's going to own the strong trap play. Okay. So you can see on each of those plays, someone on that side of the line is going to own that play and get us into the right block and scheme. The weak side trap, the weak side counter, and the weak side counter sweep, those are all going to be called basically by the quick guard. He's got to control that side of the line and get us in the right block and scheme. And then on the pass protection, that goes back to the strong guard. So again, we have it divided up where our offensive linemen have to own one play. The strong guard, the quick guard, have got to own a little bit more than that. But then that's going to get us into the right block and schemes and make sure that we're blocking things the right way. So again, I'm not worried about making the right call for the defense. We feel that with the different tags that we have available, we can call a play. The defense lines up, we make the call to pick on how we want to block it, and we go from there. So the ownership of the plays has been good for us over the years. And so now we'll move into the actual plays themselves.